Welcome back, everybody. This is Linda Bennett, your spiritual counselor and psychic host for Metaphysically Speaking. We're coming to you on WTMY in the Sarasota area and Facebook and Twitter, World Wide Web, YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> that's my executive producer, Shawnee. And anything else that's on there on the airwaves, check us out by typing metaspeak, M-E-T-A-S-P-E-A-K dot com. And various options will come up. You can have the current radio show for the week. You can have the archives with the different shows we've done. And you can have a bunch of my old television shows. And um, get to know us. We also have a recommended reading list. Um, we've got, um, what else? Different aspects of God still on our website. Explaining them. And, and let me make this point because today's show is going to be on two different things. One of them is Buddhism. We got a question on the website about Buddhism. Okay. And crop circles. Yes. And uh, you're going to say, how do they relate? Well, everything relates, boys and girls. But these two things also relate. And I'll tell you why. But not this moment. You're going to build up to it. <laughs> because you're going to forget the point once we finally get to the end of the show. And you're going to say, what did she say? Um, there are so many things that are relating to each other on the planet that people who understand the word synchronicity and other people who say there's no such thing as a coincidence, this is absolutely true. So you will find that you know someone who knows somebody else who knows somebody else who knows somebody else who used to live there, who went to school there, whose parents were almost getting married, but married other people, but are still friends. There are so many things that are synchronistic, you just have no idea. So synchronistic means souls are recognizing each other. They're recognizing places where they used to live in this lifetime or other lifetimes, or a relative lives there that you didn't even know you had. And there are so many people who say there's no such thing as coincidence. I agree. It's synchronicity of souls coming back together. Could be the soul of a town. I used to live in Connecticut, which I still consider my home. And the town that my ex actually found, he said, I, I know you believe in this reincarnation stuff, and, and I know we've lived there before. The minute we drove across the bridge, I knew we'd lived there before too. So you get drawn back to areas where you had a happy life. You can also get drawn back to areas where you didn't have a happy life because of stuff you need to finish, stuff you need to overcome for yourself because you don't want to be limited. So remember, you can ask your questions by posting them on metaspeak.com on our Facebook page, and uh, we will peruse them. And many of you ask the same questions, which is really great because it means you're following along with what we're discussing. And... Um, so we only answer one at a time and other people come up with very unique questions so also if you have suggestions for topics you'd like to see me cover i'll be happy to do so because we cover everything from religion to philosophy to ufos to earth energies to aliens to food um to pussy cats and puppy dogs current and events. parent uh, parrots uh, current events, yeah, the Politics. vet the vet we go to has a parrot that mimics cats and dogs, and it mimics a puppy crying and a cat meowing. Oh, that's I cannot tell you how many times I've got torn through, because I do volunteer work, torn through that place, only to come face to face with the parrot. And I'm going to wring your neck, parrot. <laughs> of course, he gets great pleasure in this. <laughs> anyway, um... So everything has a soul, everything has an intelligence, everything has a purpose, except for spiders, of course, and alligators. But nevertheless, have you ever had an alligator in your yard? I don't even live on the lake, and I've, got, I've had two alligator incidences. One in the backyard, one in the front. Yes. Things love me. Everything wants to live here. So I have a rooster that adopted me, by the way. Who needs a rooster? I don't need a rooster, but I've got a rooster. So, wait, let me put this in context for just a <laughs> second. So, Linda lives in a suburban neighborhood. And yes. when she first told me that there was a rooster living in her yard, I thought she was joking. <laughs> and while she, so did everybody else. And while she can say some pretty provocative, wild, wonderful things. And I do have a sense of humor. And you do. 
really, I didn't believe it until I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I've known Linda for over 20 years, and she's always right and totally with it, I was like, huh? <laughs> so... Trust me, there's rooster in this woman's yard. It'd be like going over to your friend's gated community, gorgeous neighborhood, and... A tiger comes out. Yeah, it's very bizarre. Yeah. Anyway, back to the Buddhism question. <laughs> so, we are going to be discussing Buddhism today, which, if you follow a religion, and I don't believe Buddhism is a religion. I agree with the Dalai Lama that it's a philosophy. It's a lifestyle. Like, I'm a yogi. That means we go to God in all forms. I have two nativity scenes up year-round, even though I was raised Catholic and cannot stand the Catholic Church in general, although they have the best library on the planet. Um, I don't like the politics of religions. I study Judaism, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, which are, are actually um, uh, English Catholics. Um, what else did I study there? I'm trying to think. It doesn't matter. I studied everything. And I've continued to study. If, if I was going to be a religion, I would be a Buddhist. Buddhists are a little more confined than yogis. So I have my nativity scene up. I have my Buddha and Avalokiteswara statues. I have big posters of Pele, who is the goddess of Hawaii uh, and the fire and the volcanoes. But actually, she is the female aspect of God in the fire form for this planet. The Archangel Michael is the Archangel of healing and fire. Um, I have, who do I have? I've got Ganesha, who is the elephant uh, god, elephant head, man's body. And he's got the little rat with him because Ganesha brings blessings to you. And he brings so many blessings that you can afford to take care of a little rat that's homeless and needs a place to stay. And you are so prosperous that you can take care of this rat. I've got angels all over the place. I've got dragons. I've got green Tara we're going to talk about in a few minutes because she relates to Buddhism and something else. So that means if you're a yogi, you can go to God in the form of nature, which Wiccans do. You can go to God in the form of just light. You can go to God in any aspect. And before you say, but they're different gods. No, they're not. How many cells do you have in your body? Is each one a separate person? No, it's part of you. Why should there be fewer aspects of God than their cells in your body? Because a God force is far larger than your body. So it means that people who can only understand, say, God through healing would focus on green Torah. People who only focus on motherly love might focus on the Marys. Mary Mother, Mary Magdalene. Don't have a fainting spell out there, you Catholics. Mary Magdalene exists. She existed. Her spirit still travels with Mary Mother travel together. We'll talk more about it at the Christmas show. If you want patience and compassion, you would deal with Buddha and Avalokiteswara, which is the female aspect. If you um, want to deal with uh, knowledge and wisdom, you would look at the female aspect of God in Hinduism through Sarvasvati. So there are different personalities of the God force. And for people who can only focus on one aspect in each lifetime, they find the aspect of God that best suits their personality or what they need to learn. Rather than saying, this is so complex, I just don't get it. So they focus on one part. And since you can have thousands of lifetimes, at least hundreds, you can take your time. You can really learn about God in that particular form. Well, Buddha was a Hindu prince. It's called Siddhartha. And he came to understand through his journey, you know the story, you saw Keanu Reeves playing the part of Buddha. He was born a Hindu pre, uh, prince. His father didn't want him to know anything about the outside world. He didn't want him to know that people um, uh, got old, they got sick, they got tired, they died. He didn't want him to know anything that was unpleasant. But one day, he looked over the wall and he had his guide take him out in the streets. And he discovered three truths. All people get sick. All people get old. All people die. How come my father didn't tell me this? So after the birth of his baby, his wife gave birth to their son, the prince. 
he decided he was going to go out and explore. Now you're saying, well, what kind of a husband was he? His mission on the planet was not to be a husband. In the earthly aspect of his responsibilities, he had to provide his father with an heir because he was taking off to go serve the world. So he provided his father with an heir. And then he went on his journey. And everywhere he went, he discovered that people were uh, depriving themselves of food and water, and they thought they were getting more spiritual that way. Then he found others who overindulged, and he thought they were finding God that way. And he discovered that the best way to live life is in moderation. Nourishing food, not in large quantities. Drink the water you want. Although in those days it was tough to drink the water because there were crocodiles in it. Think about that when you believe the story of Moses floating in the reeds along the Nile River, packed with crocodiles and hippopotami and giant 12-foot cobras. Ask yourself, did Moses really float there? Did his mother really put him back there? Did his mother go in and get out alive again? No, it's a metaphor. We'll discuss that in the Christmas show. So Buddha discovered that calmness, compassion for living beings, peace, inner examination, inner prayer and meditation, brought you to a state of non-fear, non-aggression, compassion for all living things, and a state of grace. That is if you remember the part that Keanu Reeves played and when Buddha was meditating under the Bodhi tree, this giant cobra came along and stretched itself up because it was starting to storm and he spread out his hood and he covered Buddha like a giant umbrella. Buddha never flinched. He wasn't upset. He knew it wasn't his time to go. He knew the cobra could have swallowed him because it was a large cobra in the depiction of the mythology. Maybe your cobra slid over and rested its head on his knee. We don't know. But he had compassion for all things and no fear because he knew that when you physically die, you don't spiritually die. You just move to a new address. You go to the level in the astral world that suits your level of spirituality. He was a Hindu who founded a different philosophy of simplicity and compassion and gentleness and understanding for all sentient beings. That means beings that have a soul. All life. And so therefore, over the years, because humans being what they are, and humans are not my favorite species because they tend to be mean and petty and especially conquerors, not my favorite people. Over the years, there have developed three types of Buddhism. The number one is called Theravada. And um, this one comes from the Pak language, which means the doctrine of the elders. And they use meditation to train the mind and encourage freedom from suffering. Now, we're going to have suffering. If you're in a physical body, you're going to suffer. If you're a woman, every month you suffer. If you're a man, you suffer from not being able to provide. If you're a good soul, if you're a good being, if you're a responsible person, you want to take care of your wife, you want to take care of the babies, the children, you want to provide a home. If you're a wife with that kind of energy of providing, you want to do the same thing. And so therefore, I'm going to tell you now, if you're in a physical body, you're going to suffer. It allows you through the suffering and the letting go of the suffering to reach a state called nirvana, which is inner divine peace. It is the earliest form of Buddhism. Then Mahayana, which I understand is the largest group, and that comes from the eastern area of India. And it is the, the um, group of people who include additional text beliefs. They've added some parts of Hinduism, some parts of of uh, tribal uh, knowledge and wisdom that was there before and they practice universal compassion and they want to awake the mind and there's also some mysticism spirituality miracles as they say in Catholicism or Christianity or whatever you want to call it 
So when Buddha said, they said, people were questioning him after he had reached his state of nirvana and his God awakening, which Jesus did also, which Mary did, which Krishna did, others we whose names we don't know because they were lost to history. And make remember, they didn't record women in those days, just like a lot of women composers and artists are just now being discovered because they weren't paid attention to in the 17 and 1800s. He said, no, I am not God. They said, well, what are you? He said, I'm awake. Awake to the universal consciousness. Awake to the God consciousness. He never said he was God. Jesus never said he was God. So when people say, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, as if it's God, that's not true. Jesus was a highly elevated being, just like Buddha was a highly elevated being who reached divine consciousness while here on earth, which is a very tough thing to do. The third type of Buddhism is called Tibetan Buddhism, obviously coming from the Tibetan area. And that also derives some of its information from the Tang group. If you saw on PBS that group of uh, people who were climbing up into these um, caves in uh, Tibet and Lhasa, and they were discovering that there were amazing imagery on the walls of the caves that had been painted by monks, just beautiful artwork and thousands of sheets of vellum, which is animal skin that was made into parchment um, and written on and had ancient texts written on them. Um, this is obviously from the north. And this uh, is a type of Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism. And again, it incorporates other, other techniques and other teachings. And um, it also is called Tantric Buddhism. Tantra means action. You know, if you see on HBO or Showtime or one of these groups of stations where they have these people practicing sex and they're calling it Tantric sex, screwing around for the weekend is not Tantric sex. Tantric sex is a spiritual practice. Tantric sex means practicing the love for each other, in a God-conscious manner, a God-respectful manner. But the word tantric means action. So even though these different forms took, um, these different types of Buddhism took form based upon their location and the understanding of the people around them and the traditions that already were there, they're still all important and they still all have meaning. And the Tang people are the ones who existed in Tibet and Lhasa and Nepal before the Buddhists. And they're the ones who created many of these caves. And we come back, we're going to continue with Buddhism and the artwork in the caves. Stay with us, Linda Bennett. And welcome back. This is Linda Bennett with Metaphysically Speaking. Remember, you can find us on WTMY in Sarasota. And you can find us on the World Wide Web. And you can find us on Facebook. The internet, YouTube, just type in metaspeak, M-E-T-A-S-P-E-A-K.com, and we'll pop up. You can see other television shows that I've done and radio shows and what else? Metaphysically Speaking, of course. Metaphysically Speaking, which is the title of all of the things that I do. We shortened it for Metaspeak so you wouldn't have to spell. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, my director, Dan, who's the first... Um, uh, director I had in that station, you know, Dan and his wife, Lisa, uh, is the one who created the term meta. He says, I can't write metaphysically speaking out every time I have to write something. So he said, can we call it meta speak uh, for the paperwork and stuff? I said, sure. So, so Dan didn't have to <clears throat> Dan did it. It's Dan's fault. So um, we're talking about the beautiful artwork. If you saw those programs and you can still catch them. And I don't know if PBS archives, but it's about the caves in um, Tibet, Nepal, and Lhasa where they found the magnificent artwork. They found giant portraits of their type style of artwork of Buddha, Avalokiteswara, otherwise known as Kuan Yin. I happen to feel they're two different souls, but I've got no way of proving it. And Green Tara. There's also White Tara. Green Tara deals with physical healing, physical healing spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and compassion. And White Tara deals more with compassion and understanding and less to do with the physical. She will help you have compassion for others or yourself if you're ill or others are ill or suffering. 
but she's more with the spiritual aspect where green tar helps you through the day. Buddha is the sign and the symbol and the energy and the understanding of compassion for all beings. So is the female aspect of Avalokiteshvara. Now, many Buddhists will tell you that Avalokiteshvara, oh no, Avalokiteshvara wasn't Buddha. No, Avalokiteshvara wasn't Buddha. She was a female aspect of Buddha. They say she's a bodhisattva, which means she's under Buddha. Well, guess what? In those days, everybody was under men. You still have religions today like Islam, which wants women under men. Although I've had discussions with several Islamics and they've said, well, in the real um, Quran, I said, yeah, the real Quran is just as contradictory as the real Bible, which is not the real Bible because too much was edited out. We have no idea what it originally said. And there were no video cameras and there were no interviewers and nobody was on record. So nobody knows anything. It was generally the ideas of the tribes that wanted to take control. They created their own power structure. So, Avalokiteshvara and Buddha represent compassion, understanding, graciousness, my favorite word in the English language, patience, and if you need those qualities, I would speak to Buddha and Avalokiteshvara, or Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin is more the oriental energy. So these caves have the most incredible artwork. If any of you have any thangas, which are those rolled up beautiful silk um, uh, backgrounds with the painting on them. You can get Buddha, you can get Avalokiteshvara. Uh, I have a green tar right in my hallway. As you open my front door, you're staring at her. Um, around the corner is a giant, uh, not giant, I guess it's like two feet tall, of Mary Mother and Baby Jesus surrounded by angels. Uh, across from that is Avalokiteshvara the equivalent of Buddha, the female aspect. I mean, if I'm going to hang artwork, I've got animal prints of leopards and snow leopards. And uh, what else do I have? Oh, I have a lynx. Uh, I also have spiritual aspects that are important to me. So with these different aspects of Buddhism that represent kindness and compassion, you can still go to your Baptist church if you want and still study Buddhism because, again, it's not about you following rules and regulations of somebody else. It's about your relationship with the God force. Because like Buddha, you want to become awake. And if you look at the things that supposedly Jesus said, because again, there was nobody there from 60 Minutes recording it. No Diane Sawyer, no Katie Kirk, no Barbara Walters asking what kind of a tree do you want to be. Um, we only know from what we assume based upon some of the earlier Gnostic teachings that there isn't very much that Jesus said in the Bible, if you look at it. It's kind of a small space. The apostles, so-called, are basically talking, and most of it. But Jesus talked about love. Loving yourself, loving one another, loving God. That's very Buddhist. And when he disappeared for years and then reappeared in the Middle East, was baptized by John the Baptist, he was different. And again, there are records of him being in Tibet and Lhasa, in the caves, in the old monasteries. Yeshua from Jerusalem. Yeshua from Bethlehem. So he brought back Instead of the hellfire, we're superior, we run the world concept of the Jews at the time, and basically a lot of them now, he was more Buddhist in his philosophy of love and gentleness and kindness. And his family, as well as Yeshua and his wife Mary Magdalene, and if you know anything about Judaism, you're supposed to be married by 33, They came to bring the balance of the male-female energy back to the planet, which had been eradicated with many of the earlier religions and Judaism. Then Christianity came along and they followed through the same thing because men like to conquer. If you think I'm harping on the same thing, what do you think is wrong with the planet? Male Taliban shooting a little girl in the head because she wants to be educated. She's apparently doing very well in a London hospital but they've threatened to wipe out the family. 
I don't know what they're going to do. So these bums who claim they're following Shahira Law shot a little girl in the head, have blinded, have thrown acid in the faces of other little girls going to school and college women. And nobody does anything about it, but they get irritated if a drone kills uh, some civilians who are harboring terrorists. Something screwy here, people. So Jesus talked about love. Mary appears in places that are going to encounter terrible strife. When I say appears, all of you know about the different locations of the appearance of Mary over a Coptic church in Egypt, look what's happened in Egypt, over Yugoslavia, which Sarajevo, the Croatians, etc. In Georgia, Conyers, Georgia, and that is the home of a lot of hatred of Northerners. They're still fighting the Confederate War, which they call in the South, they don't call it the Civil War, they call it the Northern Aggression Against the States. Talk about rewriting history, they should be politicians. It wasn't Northern Aggression Against the United States. It was about keeping the country together. It was about abolishing slavery. It was about the South learning how to manage its own business without slaves. It was about not having them separate out because that would have been a disaster. It would have been another Sarajevo, another Croatians and Serbs war. So Buddhism is about compassion, forgiveness, because you cannot have compassion without forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean forgetfulness. If someone has beaten you, you don't forget it, but you forgive them. You don't go back for another beating. And remember, no matter how many times you try, try, try to make this happen, ladies, it doesn't. You cannot change anybody else. Regardless of how much they love you, they must change for themselves. And sadly, more than half of them never change because they get ingrained in a way of doing things. Their egos get in the way. They can even be influenced by evil and they stay the way they are. And the minute you make them mad, they go right back to the way they were before. So find somebody who's already good find somebody who's already kind or stay single. And yes, men, there are women out there who are just as abusive as you can be. Stay away from them. I hope they get bred out by natural selection. If you keep marrying these creeps, they're going to pass along the genetics. So therefore, you can have compassion for their souls, but that doesn't mean you let them move in doesn't mean you let them move back. If you're a parent and you've got a kid who's abusing alcohol or drugs or gambling or whatever else they could be abusive of or stealing, they stay out of the house. Where do they go? Let them live under a railroad bridge or let them live in a mall and let them learn the hard way that they have choices. What about counseling? Counseling is 100% effective with a good counselor. Not a feel-good counselor is going to tell you what you want. I do not endorse Scientology. They started Narconon, which is a good program, but they force you to become a Scientologist. So let's say... You're... Religion does not cure anything. Religion is not a cure-all. Religion is a set of rules that somebody else wants you to follow. A philosophy is a way of living, like Buddhism, like being a yogi. So just to clarify, because... I don't want anyone to think that you're overly extreme about. If you find your kid has experimented with pot, you're not saying... There's a difference. Don't throw the kid out. Yeah. <laughs> get the kid in counseling. Yeah. Just want to clarify And if that. you want to know what happens as you get older, look at a lot of the comedians who are busy endorsing marijuana. Look at the politician who ran for president who didn't have a brain in his head. Marijuana literally kills off short-term memory cells. Look at kids in school, how the grades plummet when they're regular marijuana users or even saturation marijuana users like on weekends. The grades go down. They can't remember things. They forget appointments. They forget dates. They forget meeting with their advisors. 
They forget meeting with their friends. They're busy getting high. Anybody who does drugs and alcohol today, after the last 65 years of knowing that it's lousy, you don't have my sympathy. You have my sympathy if you go and stay in counseling. And you know what? If your mother hated you like my mother hated me, I don't smoke, drink, or do drugs. Because I didn't want to wind up like them. So you can't tell me about your crappy childhood because I'll match your childhood for childhood. The only thing I didn't have was sexual abuse, and I'm grateful for that. So therefore, regardless of your circumstances, you don't enslave yourself from one addiction to the other, which is why I have a problem with AA. Though it's helped many people, it's very Christian. And people think unless they become Christian, they're going to fail and they drop out of AA and don't go for other counseling. Narconon is not your answer. So ask your local community, even ask your minister. If you find a minister in your community who is not trying to thump you into his church and is a good counselor, or she is a good counselor, ask if you can join their uh, addicts group, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever they do. It's probably going to be an AA. And most of them will tell you yes. Right. And if you find an AA group that's not trying to thump you into Christianity, but wants you to understand, yes, there is something larger than you, whatever you want to call it, the light, the force, the being, the God, I don't care, then go there. I have a question. So <laughs> You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, well, We're the only ones here. I know. We only have four <laughs> minutes left in this segment. And um, this is actually a, uh, adjacent to this in terms of concept. So I see people like... I have friends who are in AA, and they are not overly Christian. They're spiritual. Then I see um, people who are like, let's say Oprah is an excellent example. To me, when I see Oprah, I almost feel like she doesn't label Jesus as her guru. Right. But that's her. it seems to me that that is like her relationship because she's right. very open to different spiritualities. Right. But she, I know, has a clearly a deep personal connection with Jesus. Right. So that was her upbringing, and she's chosen to stay with them. And it's working, right? <clears throat> For her, it's working, right. absolutely. So some people who may label themselves Christians, who love maybe Mary, who love maybe Jesus, may may not have the word, because words can be funny anyway, but may not have the word guru or spiritual teacher on the highest level associated with that aspect of God. But there are... That's kind of it, but I, I find it intriguing when I find people like that who are also open to other things, and I feel like they are spiritual, and it's refreshing. Yes, it is. The idea is to get spiritual, not religious. Right. Because religion is man-made, spirituality is universal. It's on every planet, every place, every place in the astral world. Even those in a level of hell are now understanding spirituality versus religion including their voodoo, sorry, Santeria, but if you draw blood, it's evil. Anybody who draws blood, anybody who causes physical harm, that's evil. What is God going to do with your blood? I know the ancient philosophy that I saw in Ancient Aliens, which we're going to talk about in the next segment, um, talks about how the Mayans sacrificed blood because it was precious. What in the world is God going to do with a cup of your blood? Not a damn thing. God doesn't want your blood. God wants you to focus your soul on God. If you have to find God through looking at clouds, it doesn't matter. If you have to find God through dealing with Jesus and what Jesus theoretically said, it doesn't matter. If you find God by staring at a daffodil, a bunny rabbit, an elephant. One of my favorite creatures on the planet is an elephant. Others are pussycats. You may have guessed that by listening to my shows regularly. I love snow leopards. National Geographic currently is featuring cheetahs. Cheetahs and snow leopards do not prey on humans, interestingly enough. And I helped save a cheetah, a snow leopard years ago at a rehab center. Most precious creature. An animal rehab center. An animal rehab just center, not a people rehab center. Yeah, so the idea that. is to become more spiritual, raise above the limitations of your religion, if you love Jesus, then keep loving Jesus, but love the real Jesus. Don't love the Bible Jesus. Love the Jesus' decent kindness teachings. Love the Buddha teachings. 
love the Mary teachings where she has compassion for all beings. When we come back, we're going to continue with this and crop circles. How does this relate? Welcome back, everyone. This is Linda Bennett with Metaphysically Speaking. Um, in the last segment, we were talking about whichever aspect of God, whichever higher being you're attracted to, then stick with that and open your heart and your mind to others as well. Because the more you know about one true aspect of God, the more you know about the other. Because basically the message is universal. Respect your mind and body. Educate your mind. Yogananda, who brought yoga to the United States back in the 20s, said, the more you read, the more you learn, the more you know, the better you will be and you will not be fooled. The more you meditate, the more you understand spirituality. Meditation is universal. Catholic nuns meditate. Buddhist nuns and priests meditate. It is a meditation universal energy on the planet. Now, Shawnee, my executive producer, mentioned the word guru. And like avatar, this is misused by trendy individuals who are looking for something snappy and exotic. A guru is a teaching saint. Even Catholic saints like Little Flower Saint Teresa, who I particularly love, taught. And she taught persistence. And she had severe illnesses as she, as she was getting on her age. She did not get old. Many of the Catholic saints did not get old. And I'm not talking about the early bishops who got killed off by a neighboring king. And they really shouldn't be saints. But I'm talking about people who truly lived a certain way. Saint Bernadette is another favorite of mine. They were mercilessly, one, the head nun was mercilessly cruel to her, and then they discovered, they called it a tuberculin knee, but it was really a cancer that was in her bones and her knees, and these huge, horrible sores. And when the, when the um, sur, um, Mother, Mother Superior, Superior. Mm -hmm. I used to be one in another lifetime, when the Mother Superior saw it, she was appalled and humiliated her own cruelty and her arrogance and thinking this girl was arrogant and realized she had her scrubbing floors for years and she had cancerous knees. What a lesson to learn. So that doesn't mean you have to suffer, but it means you're transcending the physical body with the spiritual body. So that means a guru is a teaching saint. That means someone who reached a certain level of God consciousness and has the personality type to come back and teach. Yogananda's one. If you're familiar with Sri Yukteswar, he's another one. Um, he never left India. He stayed there, but you know, Yogananda was his student. He was Yogananda's guru. And Yogananda came to the United States and brought spirituality and Hindu teaching, although he didn't call it Hindu teaching because believe it or not, in those days, you could be deported for teaching Hinduism. So you had to be really low key. And he happened to love Jesus and he happened to love Krishna. So that worked out nicely. So therefore, a guru is a teaching saint. You do not need a guru to reach higher spiritual consciousness. If you're lucky enough to find one or a good spiritual teacher, and I mean a good spiritual teacher who teaches you what I'm teaching you and doesn't have a personal agenda to make you something else but wants you to raise yourself up out of your doldrums, out of your stuckness, out of the tar like Br'er Rabbit, and be a better soul. Be more kind, be more compassionate, be more gracious, be more understanding, be more loving, be more sharing and nurturing. Then that's someone you want to pay attention to. And we say, Linda, I just cannot wrap my head around Buddha or Jesus or Mary. Fine, talk to the trees. I talk to the soil when I'm digging a hole. I talk to the plants that I'm putting in. I buy them and I tell them, look, tomorrow I'm putting, putting you in. So sit down, get adjusted from the car ride and uh, you're going to be fine. And you tell me where you want to go. Because sometimes I have an idea I'm going to put a plant in a certain place. The next day I come out and the plant doesn't want to be there. And I wind up putting it someplace totally different and it works. It decided because the plant has a consciousness. The earth has a consciousness that it wants to be somewhere else. But then you were tuned in enough to listen. Yes. 
I've always been able to talk to plants, and so did my father. Does everyone have the ability to do everyone that? Everyone has the ability to listen to a tree. Before I prune, the day before, I tell them I'm pruning. Sometimes I realize I'm going to have extra time, so I tell the hedges, oh, okay, I'm going to come back later and I'm going to prune you. And what the plant does literally is pull its sap back from the parts of the branch that it knows you're going to trim. So you're not going to have a lot of weeping. You know, that's the sap coming out. Literally, the plant will do that if you give it enough time. The earth has a consciousness. If you say, I'm going to focus on God through the beautiful cloud formations. Were you, did you ever make something happen with clouds when you were a kid? Laying down on the yard and looking nah, up. I was in New York for a long time as a kid. <laughs> New York City, so not okay. so much on the clouds. We weren't, in, we weren't in Central Park a lot or on the roof well, of your building. No. Nah, well, I did that as a kid, and I thought everybody could do that. I made the clouds come together. I made them part. I made them form shapes. I didn't know that was a big deal. And so you can talk to God through anything and everything. You can talk to God through a turtle. If you have a dog, you can talk to God through a dog. And by the way, your dog and cat know exactly what you're thinking before you think it. You can go to a sacred site like the pyramids, like Angkor Wat, which is that amazing temple in Cambodia, which is surrounded. It's basically an island. The worship area is, sur is basically an island in this amazing lake that was all man-made, amazingly intricately carved and crop circles. What are crop circles? That was one of the questions from our website. Right. Somebody wanted to know what are crop circles and are fake crop circles still happening? I don't think anybody's doing fake crop circles anymore because the crop circles, which have been documented since the 1800s, by the way, before we had modern machinery, Good luck, by the way. We only have 10 minutes on <laughs> taking this topic on very bravely. Oh, my gosh. 10 minutes left to go. <laughs> crop circles are a combination of things. It's the Earth spirit working with UFOs who are attuned to this planet and helped in the formation of planet Earth and the population of planet Earth. It's the two working together. There are many people who are physicists, mathematicians, who have seen that the crop circles all have a mathematical formulation. It all works back to the golden ratio, which if you think of a nautilus shell, it starts out wide and then it goes, spins tighter and tighter and tighter. And they are magnificent. They're extraordinarily intricate, many of them. They are patterns with patterns and within patterns. And they all have mathematical formulations that all tell a story. And when you unravel the mathematical formulation and you know what the basic number of that is and what it means, you now have a message. And there are people who do that. If you go online and type in crop circles, let's see if I can find the name of this fellow because I happen to have a whole bunch of crop circle patterns here. This is Freddie Silva, S-I-L-V-A. It's www.lovelyclaranet. I think there's a dot there. Okay, www.lovely, L-O-V-E-L-Y, dot Clara, dot net. And he has a whole bunch of crop circle patterns that he has put together in different formations on, I guess this is what, eight and a half by 14. Where is he out of? He's out of Canada. Mm. And one of my students found him. And in fact, he's got a Nautilus shell right here. And um, if you're a mathematician, if you're a physicist, you can figure out the formulations. And he also has several books out that explain the different crop circles. Now, why is this happening? Well, very few people are listening to God. And this is a way of gaining attention. This is a way of, for people to say, wait a minute, there's something other than me, myself and I, that's important on this planet. It's a way of creating beauty and harmony. And in England, they're usually near henges. Those are, there's more than Stonehenge. There are a whole bunch of them all through England. They're also in Canada and in certain places in northern the United States. Many farmers have stopped reporting them except to the crop circle experts 
who keep track of everything and take uh, uh, above ground photographs because they can only be seen above ground like the Nazca lines in Peru where they have the giant hummingbird and the giant spider which are basically sight lines for ships that came in from other places and once upon a time back in Atlantis and Lemuria interplanetary travel was normal just like you can take a plane to New York you can take a plane to London you could take a plane to the United to the to the planet Earth and you could take a plane to other planets again that will happen but not now but the consciousness is being raised in many ways one is UFO sightings and I think it was the last show we had the um, man from New York or Connecticut I can't remember which who had seen many UFOs. I've had UFO sightings. Many, many of us have. In fact, one of my students, the Crop Circle Girl, had a UFO sighting just recently where I had the UFO sighting years ago over the same body of water in the same location. And there were buildings marking in that area so it's really easy to tell where it was. So it's different forms of personages old relatives, friends, and loved ones from other planets who live like maybe they live in Germany on this planet, they live on another planet other than Earth. They're coming back to give people hope, to give people understanding that they're being watched by the universe. The ambassador ships, which is what I call them, are ships that come and keep tabs on planet Earth to make things not go out of line. Remember years ago when NORAD was down? Mm -hmm. Remember years ago when every missile site across the world was shut down and inoperable? The Russians, the United States, the Chinese, all simultaneously. I think it took place over a period of an hour and then boom, everything was back online. They're trying to let us know that blowing each other up is not the way to go. It's not the God way to go. They're trying to tell us that there are other ways of thinking that we'd better get with the program or they're going to allow more of the earth to be destroyed than we would like that will not only erase hauntings and imprints but will erase negative people mean people cruel people so is it almost like with sandy we ain't seen nothing yet yes all right the tsunami in southeast asia thailand sandy that three convergence storms together that we experienced here in Florida. I never saw so much rain in my life except in a hurricane. And it really didn't amount to hurricane winds, but we had hurricane rains. The blizzard of 88, which basically there was an earthquake at the same time, around the same time the New Madrid Fault. It was also the last time that the stock exchange in New York closed down. There were certain time frames that the God Force, the angels, the archangels that watch out for the Earth, and the ambassadors from other planets that travel on ambassador ships. That was my experience. Like the UFO, just to translate. Absolutely. The ambassador ships that UFOs travel on. These are people who specialize in certain planets, specialize in certain problems, want to go, and when they are in an area, they raise the consciousness of everyone there. Whether you realize it or not, they send out a vibration like a radio vibration, like an internet connection that you're receiving. There are mind thoughts. Just like if you want to be mad at your dog because he, you didn't get home in time and he did his business on the carpet and you've got a newspaper rolled up and you're saying, come to daddy, come to daddy for a treat. The dog sees pictures. You see pictures. That's part of dreaming. You see pictures of life. The dog sees your pictures. Your cat sees your pictures. And they're going to hide. Because they know what you're really up to. Because you're thinking about it. So therefore, it's the consciousness of the Earth, the angels, and the UFOs that watch out for this planet that are giving you intelligent, beautiful forms. There isn't, I, what, what, I have a dozen posters up here with all these different symbols. There may be 15, 12 different symbols on each poster. And not one of them is ugly. Some of them are amazingly different. You would not expect this to be a crop circle. They're all intricate. They're all beautifully designed because God is beauty. And they're recreating the beauty and trying to wake people up. 
they're creating these amazing structures. When I say structure, it is a structure. You have a low level and you have a higher level. So therefore, this is the God force trying to get everybody's attention. If you say, I want to be a Catholic for the rest of my life, say, so I'll say, great, but understand, look up at the sky. We're in a solar system, which is in a galaxy, which is in a bigger galaxy, which is in a mega galaxy, which is in a super mega galaxy, and we're just one of millions. Do you think God really gives a bunny rabbit's backside whether or not you're Catholic, Jewish, or Muslim, or Protestant? No. The God forced the angels care about what you're doing with your life. Are you being constructive? Are you being kind? Are you being helpful? Are you the kind of person you would be proud to meet? Are you the kind of person you'd be proud to marry to? Are you the kind of person you'd be proud to raise as a, to raise children with? Are you the kind of person that should be proud to have God and the angels watching? Because guess what? They are. We're like ants in a terrarium to the universe. Kids make terrariums. They have the little ants crawling around. They bring in a special, uh, special day when the kids work on science projects. That's what we're like. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, people. Your thoughts, your actions are recorded in the universe. And they go in something called the Akashic Records, which is an ancient Sanskrit name. And so therefore, this is how the universe keeps track of different souls and different actions, good deeds, bad deeds. Remember that Santa Claus song, gonna find out if you're naughty or nice? All important deeds and thoughts are recorded. It's also how you know what your karma is going to be in your next lifetime. So if you're a person who is proud of yourself with dignity, not ego pride, not because you made more money, not because you got a great dress, not because you drive a sports car. To me, they're like coffins with wheels, but that's just my thought. If you're the kind of person that can meet God third eye to third eye at the end of every day and be proud of yourself that you did good things. You're on the right path. If you say that God is too large for me to comprehend, I'll say fine. Look at a tree. Look at a child. Look at a pussycat. And know that God and the angels are always with you if you just open up your hearts and minds to God's universal truth. This is Linda Bennett with Metaphysically Speaking. <laughs>